the current stage of nuclear waste storage here in the U.S. is dead stop. I mean, it's just dead stop. The U.S. program is, I would say, in gridlock. We're stuck. Right now, there are 39 states out of the 50 that have high-level nuclear waste or spent nuclear fuel in them. So that's 39 out of 50. So there's kind of like this critical mass, pardon the pun, of states that ought to be interested in getting it out of there. You only have two choices. You leave it where it is, where it wasn't designed to be and will be a growing environmental threat over time, or you move it to some place to isolate it from the environment. There are your two choices. The plans that the government had and that we put into law back in the 1980s to move that waste to a central repository, one or more central repositories, that, that hasn't worked. We haven't been able to, to build a central repository. We haven't been able to move waste. Uh, so uh, most, most of it's right there where it was originally produced. You cannot leave this stuff forever above ground in deep swimming pools where it is at reactors now or in the concrete and steel dry casks where it is at reactors right now. Eventually, those mechanisms of storage will fail and that material will get right into the environment. What we don't know is how long those mechanisms of storage will last. Will they last 50 years? Will they last 100 years? Will somebody be around who's got a sense of responsibility 150 years from now to manage this stuff? Well, we don't know. The most radioactive waste, the most dangerous waste, need to be permanently isolated from humankind for years to come. The half-life of plutonium-239 is 24,000 years. And if you breathe one microscopic speck of that into your lung, you're guaranteed cancer. Regardless of your views of nuclear issues, pro or con, I think most people would agree that the nuclear materials need to be safely managed for centuries, if not longer. And so that's something that society has to deal with no matter what. Spent nuclear fuel, in the case of Sweden, is a waste that has to be isolated from man and environment for 100,000 years. It does tell you something about what kind of waste we're dealing with. The government is now reimbursing many of these utilities for the cost of storage because the courts have ordered the government to do that since the, the government's uh, promise to to go ahead and build a repository uh, did not uh, happen. So far, the taxpayers have paid over $5 billion to pay for this waste. The projection is at least $22 billion. Don't you think we could be doing something else with that $22 billion? That's a lot of money. Scientists from other countries have asked me why can't your country make a decision and stand behind it? And I don't know the answer to that. I think the political fight is between those who want to just mandate the establishment of a permanent repository at Yucca Mountain and uh, proceed to go ahead and build it and move waste to that site. And uh, the, many of the people in Nevada and their representatives, their elected leaders, who believe that's an unfair way for the nation to dispose of its nuclear waste. And they think that uh, uh, other options have not been adequately considered, uh, that other states have not participated in, in this solution, and that it is not a good thing for Nevada to wind up being the sole nuclear waste repository for utilities all over the country. It doesn't matter whether we're going to put it in Nevada, whether we're going to put it in Utah, whether we're going to put it in Pennsylvania, whether we're going to put it in New Jersey. The same dynamic is going to happen because basically there will always be people in leadership positions, particularly at, in, at political and political um, positions, that will find it to their advantage to say, I don't want it and I don't want it in my state. If I was to take you to that 
area of Nevada and take you up to the top of the mountain, and I've been there multiple times, and you look around, you can't see a thing other than desert. And I, now my first reaction was, you know what, if we can't figure out that putting spent nuclear fuel a thousand feet below the surface of this mountain here in the middle of nowhere, we can't put it anywhere. Totally wrong. Totally wrong. I, I disagree. And I can give you the example of why. Because we've already made it work in the U.S. We made it work at the Waste Isolation Pilot Project in Carlsbad, New Mexico. It's the only operating deep geologic repository in the world. Now, it's not for high-level waste. It's for transuranic waste, and it's for transuranic waste from the nuclear weapons complex only. But it is operating, or actually, at the moment, it's shut down because they've had a, an incident there. But it, it wasn't straightforward, it wasn't easy, but it did open, and it has accepted a lot of, of waste so far. So we can do it in this country. We can do it at places other than Nevada. Personally, I believe sounds really good in theory, it will not work in practice. It really is a political decision about where in the country we're gonna put all of this stuff. And it's 100% certain that wherever we pick, somebody's gonna not want it there. That's 100% that's certain. So how do you overcome that? 100% I agree with him. You know, there are uh, projects where uh, the state tries to locate a museum or a library, and even for those projects, you wouldn't imagine anybody opposing, and there are always people opposing to a project. So for a final repository for spent fuel, a very dangerous waste, of course, you should be expecting some opposition at some level. Consent does not mean 100% of the people. It's not unanimity. That's 100% of the people. Consent is a majority of the people. So yes, you will never get 100% of the people to agree to probably anything. But you will get a majority. Other countries are struggling with it as well, and some of them have uh, made much better progress than we have in finding a way to dispose of the nuclear waste from spent fuel. The other major programs, France, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, Canada, they all reached a crisis point, uh, not too different from our own. And at this crisis point, they had to reevaluate how they would go forward. Uh, they each chose a slightly different path, um, but having thought about it and so having selected a, a new path, uh, one can also observe their programs are moving forward. I think uh, lots of difficulties are not with the technical development. It's more uh, interacting with the public, finding those communities that would like to cooperate with us to solve basically a national challenge on a local scale. France uh, has a very specific uh, policy, which is to recycle the spent nuclear fuel in order to recover the variable materials which can be used to produce electricity, so plutonium and uranium. So it means that we are saving uranium ore, we are decreasing the volume of the ultimate waste, we are also decreasing the radiotoxicity of the waste, and at the end, what, what, what we have to manage in the long term is only the 4% of fission products. There's a next generation of researchers coming online, and I want to save them the time that it took me to realize what the problems are. The beauty of a conference like this and holding it at a place like Stanford University and CSAC is that uh, all the right people are here. There's nothing better than to bring in expertise when you're starting to look at a very difficult problem that has never really been solved yet in human history. We can, in a very frank and open setting, talk about challenges, talk about the setbacks and how we've moved forward. This is the discussion we need to have. It's still possible. 
at least in my lifetime, I'm 64. Uh, in my lifetime, it's still possible to do it. I, I, I believe that. I don't give it better than 50-50, but I think it's still possible to do it. My God, you solved bigger problems than this one. And if little Sweden, nine million inhabitants, and Finland, even fewer people, would solve this issue, of course you can.